I need to make sure that. Uh, yep, that looks good. So far, so good. Not quite live yet, but I have that. Okay, um, it looks like we're indeed live now. So <clears throat> uh, that is all good. Um, check, check, double check. Someone's already saying hi, and there's four people in the room. Nice. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Vincent. I'm still replacing Rachel, who is uh, currently moving across the United States. Uh, quite a trip. Um, so I'm taking over the office hours. Uh, I'm one of her direct colleagues. Uh, and with me today, we've got uh, one of our machine learning researchers. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Felicia. Um, Felicia, we, we sometimes have collaborated a little bit on the TensorFlow uh, parts, if I recall correctly. Uh, it's been some, <laughs> yep. well, we've collaborated on a bunch of parts, but that's like the main thing that we've been working on recently. Um, and you've been at Ross, I think, for like a bit more than a year, if I recall correctly, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I started October of 2020, so um, yeah. yeah, a little bit, a little bit more than a year. A little bit more. And um, yeah, and, and like I'm the research advocate, so um, Felicia is one of the people that reviews my works from time to time. Like I sometimes make videos, and then uh, I, I do like it when researchers agree that what I've made is sensible and correct and all that. Um, and, but in particular, I think well, one thing that's kind of nice to mention also to the people sort of just tuning in, uh, both Felicia and myself have been doing a little bit of effort in trying to get the TensorFlow stuff inside of Raza to work on the M1 chip. Um, and after, um, I think, uh, months <laughs> back and forth, um, we do have a unofficial solution um, that I've just shared in the chat as well. Um, it is uh, a guide that seems to work at least for now. Um, I want to admit, hopefully it changes. Like we're hoping that the integration between M1 machines and TensorFlow improves. Um, but I wrote a little guide uh, that's also inspired by just some of the stuff that Felicia has been working on. Uh, hopefully this is something that you can use uh, to get TensorFlow and Raza to work on an M1 machine as well. Um, like out of curiosity, if, if, if you are looking back at this endeavor of, hey, uh, getting TensorFlow to work, uh, like is, is there anything that sort of stands out that people might need to be just a bit mindful of? That's a good question. Um... I think for a lot of these things, my expectation is that if if you know you can run the training without it crashing or run you know whatever you want to do if you want to train or test, um, then I think you're pretty much good. Um, I would imagine that things failing would really look like um, your training and testing crashing. So that I think is a good sign because. Sometimes you have problems where you don't really, or it's a lot harder to see whether you've gotten the solution or not. Um, but yeah, I think one thing to really stress is that it is temporary. So um, yeah, like Vincent was saying, we're hoping that we'll get a much more robust solution for everyone. Um, so yeah, making sure that, you know, the thing that you're looking at when you install this is the most up-to-date solution that we have and everything that's important. Um, Aside from that, I mean, I think we just underestimated this whole thing. Um, at least it was new to me at the start of this journey that there would be all these different libraries. Also, it's not really just TensorFlow. We always talk about TensorFlow, but it is also, um, there was a period of time where we weren't sure whether uh, scikit-learn could be installed through PIP. And we do currently do all of our installation um, out of the box, so not this this solution that Vincent is refer referencing. But you know, when you run make install for Raza, or when you do pip install Raza, um, then we're using obviously pip. So uh, that was a blocker for us for a while, and then they Scikit-Learn kind of released their um, their build on pip. So then that became unblocked. But then there were just a whole host of similar kind of problems like that yeah and well, the, so uh, it's hard to predict up front what you're going to need it's a lot of it is just okay we've removed one bottleneck and then you hit the next one um so initially i also thought like the main blocker is probably just going to be uh, tensorflow um but uh, but the thing is with raza uh like we also use sanic and we also use postgres um so 
even when I got TensorFlow and Scikit-Learn to work, I also reminded myself that Postgres needs to be installed in the machine, so like that's also a thing. Um, and, and there's like lots of little things that could go wrong, and if any one of them fail, uh, the ent entire install can also just go ahead and fail. Uh, but definitely TensorFlow in particular is a bit of a beast though. Like uh, there are lots of low level optimizations that are happening under the hood. Those low level optimizations have to work on the machine and therefore they need to be CPU instructions. Uh, so introducing like a new ARM chip all of a sudden, uh, that's definitely, yeah. <laughs> like you might hit your head a couple of times more than, than you're used to in Python. It's more than a pip install that you need. Um, we start. We, uh, by the way, we have started getting the first comments in. Uh, we have Nick uh, from the UK. That's uh, definitely nice. Um, we have the first question as well. Like, what's the stream going to be about? Um, in general, with these office hours, um, the stream will be about whatever questions the audience provides. Uh, we are more than happy to have a go at them. Um, but uh, one thing that will be just kind of good to mention is uh, Felicia is, of course, like a, a machine learning uh, researcher at Raza. Um, so it, it, historically, uh, like what, what are the things you've most recently been working on? Is there anything that you might be able to share in that? Yeah, that's a good question, because a lot of the stuff that I've done most recently yeah. is a little bit more internal. So um, right now, uh, the main focus of a smaller a sub team of researchers um, is to kind of shore up uh, some of our research foundations. So um, right now, uh, the team that I'm on, we're focused on taking stock of the algorithms that we have and the assumptions that are behind them. Um, so that's not really something that I think is exciting for your users yet, but I'm hoping that once we kind of have taken stock of what we have and figured out like what the assumptions are behind them, we can reevaluate them and make sure that everything that we're doing makes sense and solves the problem that it should solve and hopefully is also kind of the best solution that we can come up with at the time. And then the idea is also that if we have, um, if we've taken stock in this way and we've reevaluated the assumptions, then of course, um, the hope is that we can also iterate on those um, and make sure that the solutions are solving what they should solve. But there, and there's an interesting thing to dive in here, mainly because that's a common misconception that I notice. Because if you read papers on like uh, algorithms for virtual assistants, a lot of it is like, hey, we perform state of the art on intent classification. Um, and, you know, intent classification that's indeed a part of a virtual assistant. There's nothing really wrong with making a model that performs well on that task. Um, but the, a very sensible question that I've at least noticed in the research team is also just, do we really care about intent accuracy or are there other things that we should maybe care about as well? And again, like intent accuracy, it's, it matters. It's a neat, neat little proxy, um, but it's not necessarily reality itself. It's not necessarily the case that if you have a perfect intent classifier, that then your actions will be predicted correctly too. Yeah, yeah so that was kind of the theme behind um, what markers came out of the success markers. So um, that was that same idea. Yeah, it's like, okay, if you know, you might have a have a system that does really well on intent classification, but maybe that's not really the thing that you actually care about. Um, so yeah, trying to figure out what we really care about and how we can actually measure it, because there's a reason why we use um, intent classification accuracy and why that's something that, you know, not only Raza does, but really um, pretty much I think everyone does who's working on this kind of dialogue management. Um, it's because it's a really useful and easy proxy, but um, of course, we want to be able to go beyond that and really make sure that the systems that we're designing can actually do what we want them to do and aren't just good classifiers, because that's kind of a whole different problem. And, and also something that, I've, that surprises people whenever I talk to them at, at conferences, uh, which I think you might also have an anecdote or two about. Um, usually when you benchmark, you, you're doing grid search or something, right? You've got this data set and you need fit predicts and the test set and validation and all that. Um, but then one does have to ask the question, like for us as Raza, what are proper data sets to actually benchmark on? Um, so one data set that I love to demo with is the Clink data set. Uh, it comes with 150 intents. Uh, each intent has like 150 examples. Uh, and for demos, it's a great data set. Uh, I have yet to find a virtual assistant that actually uses all 150 intents that are in that data set. Uh, so one intent is like, I've lost my credit card. Another one is roll a dice. And another one is call my friend. And the other one is like, call me an Uber. Uh, I have not found a virtual assistant out there in real life that is able to do all four of those things. Um, like when you talk to a chap at a local bank, you usually get like a subset of those. Um, like that's been proven uh, to be pretty 
tricky too because you, you also want to be careful that you don't optimize for the wrong thing so the, the data sets that we choose also matter quite a bit here uh, i don't yeah. know if, if you've got like an anecdote on this but i this was also one of the major discussions i recall from some of our zoom meetings no, you're, you're totally right there. Actually, we read a really interesting paper, um, which is sort of related uh, last week as a group um, where they were discussing um, like transformer baselines. And they were saying that kind of we, a lot of papers will criticize the generalization capabilities of transformer based models, but um, oftentimes kind of the baseline is, is not as good as it could be. And there's a few simple tricks that could improve the baseline. Um, and not only that, but also it's not really clear that the data sets and the way that they're split um, on mm. these shared tasks are actually testing the thing that you want to test. So I think that's a really interesting discussion to be had. Like, how do we make sure that the data sets and how they're split actually kind of test the things that you want to test when you're designing something? Yeah, and, and there's also topics like um, just the... Just for let's suppose we just limit ourselves to intent classification. Um, just picking your labels has a huge impact. Um, so I, I did an algorithm whiteboard video. It's live now. That's about uh, the inform intent that you sometimes see when you have bots with like large forms. And very typically, someone might say, "Oh, the inform intent is used to like declare an entity." So we've got like an entity for uh, what's your credit card, what's your address, etc. But if you have a hundred and fifty examples in that one inform class. Unless in all the other classes, uh, you're going to get a class imbalance in your data set. And that might, you know, cause all sorts of numerical tomfoolery. Um, so if you just redefine the inform class to be split into like inform credit card and inform who and inform address, um, your accuracy goes up, even though the model is exactly the same. <laughs> uh, it's kind of an interesting sort of side effect there. Uh, but but um, that's also something that's very relevant to the research team as well. Like, um, anyway. Um, these are very interesting discussions, but um, I have the first couple of questions have started coming in. Um, the first question I would like to talk about is because it's about a somewhat open topic that is very hard. It's about multi-language uh, assistance. Um, so, and, and I'm hoping I pronounced it correctly, but um, Bendima uh, Mizar is asking, is there a way to use Raza for multilingual chatbots in languages like Japanese or Arabic? Yeah, so I think that um, Akila did a talk about this kind of general topic of maybe like how do you compose chatbots that have different but somewhat separate um, skills. And I think the recommendation we gave there at the time was some sort of compose at build time. Um, I mean, I think the short answer is that those are really two separate bots. And so you somehow need to handle kind of, I think I would train them and test them separately um, for each language. And then you need to come up with some way to route a user uh, to one or the other. Um, I guess it might be a little bit different depending on whether you're expecting your users to kind of switch languages in within a conversation. I don't know if that's how likely that is. Um, I'm bilingual and that's kind of how I think. So <laughs> I do sometimes switch between <laughs> between two languages. But and, uh, and uh, it's German and English, correct? Yeah. So I, I I'm uh, because the Dutch do this. I'm, I think the Germans do this as well. But like computer is a uh, English word, but it made its way into the Dutch language. And I think the same happened in German, at least with some words. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Um, so the, the the interesting weird thing is that even if you have an assistant that's German or Dutch, uh, there's going to be English in there as well. Um, but you sh but it doesn't make that much sense to sort of consider that to be a multilingual bot. Uh, it's just because a lot of internet language is seeping into uh, you know the way people like to converse online. Um, so some one thing I do also want to mention there is maybe um, assuming that you have an assistant that talks Dutch back, uh, if there's just a little bit of English mixed in the language, it's not a reason to consider it a multilingual bot. Um, another main thing that just very pragmatic. Um, do you want to play the game of, okay, if we detect the language from the user, then we're also going to reply in that language. And if the user switches from the language within the, um, uh, within the assistant, then we're going to switch language back again. And are the conversations following the same flow? Cause you got cultural differences too sometimes, right? 
um, maybe say, like saying hello. Yeah, that happens in lots of languages, but maybe uh, like the way that the Dutch want to have their complaints sorted is different than in the UK for maybe some legal reasons too. I mean, there's also cultural differences to, uh, to be mindful of. Um, I do think it's fair to say like Raza does offer a fair amount of non-English tools. Um, I th think I saw some work happening on the hugging face component as well. Have you been working on that, by the way, Felicia, or was that Matthias mainly? Yeah, Matthias has been doing that. Um, I've actually been going back and forth with him mm -hmm. on it. Um, so the the context for people that don't know um, is that my colleague, who's a machine learning engineer who started also at the end of last year, um, he is working on enabling more of the hugging face models. So I think a popular one that we get asked about is, um, I don't know if you're supposed to pronounce this camembert, but um, the, <laughs> the French one, um, that's one that we get asked about a lot and that wasn't enabled beforehand. Um, but now, yeah, my colleague is working on trying to enable more of those models. Um, so that's one thing that hopefully should help people who are trying to design assistance in different languages. I mean, the other thing I would say too is that on the topic of like language detection, um, I think that gets harder also the shorter that the sentence is. Um, and also if you have your users mistyping, which is definitely something that can and will happen. Um, so I think automatic detection is something that I would be really, really careful about. And it's probably easier if you think that you're getting users that are talking to your assistant to just give them a button or let them say exactly what language they want to converse in so that you don't have to try and detect something and possibly get it wrong. Yeah, and one thing, um, there's an algorithm wiper video on this. I think I tried the fast text language detection tool. And mm -hmm. one of the interesting thing there is, I mean, there are words that appear in Dutch as well as in English. So let's say we have an utterance with just one word and that word appears in both vocabularies. Um, fast text will just go ahead and pick the most common language, which will always be English. Um, so like even language detection tools suffer from some stuff. Uh, you cannot always blindly trust them. Um, they might work, I mean, but try it out. Like don't don't assume that every pre-trained model work, does everything for you. Um, but I do want to acknowledge it is pretty exciting to start supporting more of these hugging face models, particularly um, like I think the standard one that we provide is still the LaBase uh, language model. Which is yeah, multilingual. Yeah, so this is the weights. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, multilingual. I think 112 languages or something. Yes, um, <laughs> it's one. And also, I, I've played around with it a lot with what lies and in the uh, algorithm whiteboard as well. Uh, it, it is pretty impressive. Uh, I don't want to discount the compute power you need for that thing. It, it, you know, lots of tensors are moving around and flowing, so uh, you're going to incur some computational cost there. Um, but it's pretty decent, I found. Like even if uh, I've actually found that if I'm just doing Dutch. Um, even if I'm not doing any English whatsoever, the LaBase model actually doesn't do bad. Even though it's not specifically trained for Dutch, it seems to be performing okay for a bunch of tasks. Um, but the, another thing that's also kind of nice is some of the more lightweight hugging face models should also become available by doing this. Uh, there's definitely more lightweight models that uh, are out there, uh, and those should hopefully soon be get uh, like supported as well, which is pretty uh, exciting. Um, so if there's more questions about non-English, uh, do feel free to uh, sort of drop them. Um, there is another question coming in from Ravi Kumar, which seems to be uh, mentioned towards me, but I'm kind of curious if you've done this, Felicia. Uh, someone is asking if I've ever tried to build an HTTP server in Python from scratch. Um, I have, I, I, I can confirm that. Uh, basically because I was actually just interested in just the low level aspects of uh, if you do app.route in a web framework, how does a request actually get turned into like a Python object and back into JSON again? Um, uh, what is a whiskey server? I thought that was just super interesting. Um, there's a really good course on testdriven.io uh, where you actually implement your own whiskey server. Um, super cool. Uh, I learned a lot from it. Um, I, I, the only thing I, I, I got to ask Felicia as well, just because I'm kind of curious. Um, Felicia, uh, what, would you ever be interested in writing your own HTTP server in, in Python? <laughs> you know, I feel like I have done it, um, okay. but it was probably a while ago. I think I've done this. Um, so the thing is, I, I, I can imagine you think the same way about this. I found it very educational. Like I learned a lot from implementing that. I can imagine you had the same experience. Yeah, I think that's also how 
kind of most of my computer science education was that I was all like write these things from scratch, um, which I think is is good. Um, it can be a little bit painful and it's always, uh, I think, humbling to see how the things that you wrote from scratch are far less efficient than um, <laughs> the existing solution. Well, and, and, and the same thing kind of goes with word embeddings and stuff, right? Like, I, I also think that, like, hey, if you're curious and you're kind of on the learning path, uh, which basically everyone is, um, there's no harm in just trying to implement your own. The only thing I do want to be mindful of is even though I did in at some point write my own HTTP server, I really recommend no one use it. Um, because if you go to, like, a proper open source implementation like FastAPI, Flask, or what we're, what we're using, SANIC, um, they will have hit all sorts of rough patches, which they will also have fixed, which your little web server probably does not. And especially if you're doing HTTP stuff, uh, so the security aspect is something you shouldn't ignore. Um, and security is one of these things where either you're in the field or you're outside of it. And if you're outside of it, it's probably best to leave it at the folks uh, who are just a little bit more familiar. Uh, on the topic of self-study, though, like I think stuff like implementing your own embeddings is actually kind of a useful exercise. Uh, I can imagine, Felicia, would you agree that writing your own uh, stochastic gradient descent, is that like a thing you've built yourself as well? Mm -hmm. like that, I found that to be more insightful than I anticipated, just so you, I don't know, yeah. what, like lots of numeric stuff can go wrong there, which is kind of funny, I, uh, I've noticed. Like, I don't know, like what was your main lesson from implementing that yourself? What was my main lesson? I think it was just kind of like drilling home the different dimensions and things that I was working with um, and just understanding the underlying math. I'm yeah. wondering what was the main lesson. Um, so the, the main thing that stuck with me is you're taught this thing called gradient descent. And, you know, it, it feels like mathematically it's a pretty sound idea. Um, but then if, if the surfers are trying to search and is even just a little bit hilly, I mean, weird things can happen all of a sudden, like. Uh, and, and the fact that there's no free lunch there, uh, that was something I was a little bit uh, overly optimistic in. Like, I remember being bitten by that a couple of times. Um, and that also helps to appreciate all the stuff that TensorFlow is doing under the hood, because they're not just doing all of those numeric things such that, you know, the system even converges. It is trying to do that while it's also trying to be fast, uh, which, which, you know, is a much harder problem than I initially thought, at least. Um, and that's in that sense, I'm also just kind of curious, uh, again, uh, everyone, uh, oh, there's, there's another question that just came in. Hang on. Um, uh, that's a good question for Felicia as well. Uh, what are some of the current lines of research? Uh, with a question in general, like, what's next for Raza? Um, and um, I should mention, like, there are some things that are, like, uh, definitely super speculative, uh, like, maybe we shouldn't mention every brain fart that we, that we have in the in the Slack channel. I mean, there's some really interesting ideas, but some of them definitely deserve more attention. Uh, but there are some ideas in the, like up in the air, at least. So Felicia, are there like some thoughts that you've been having recently that, that seem like cool experiments to try out with? Well, I think you're right about being careful about how speculative this is, because I think... Um, it is research. You know, it is research. Um, we'll see. But um, there are always kind of big ideas that I think we're all interested in tackling or at least trying out. Um, one example is the famous and notorious contextual NLU. Um, we love to talk and think about that. And what, um, what is contextual NLU? Could you explain it a little bit? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to drop <laughs> that without explaining it. Um, what I mean by that is just um, kind of different ways to disambiguate between uh the a message that a user might send um and to figure out based on kind of the surrounding context of the conversation what did they say before what did the assistant say before um to figure out what they mean because sometimes you get things that people say which are ambiguous right like maybe if they're being sarcastic or maybe if you ask them a yes or no question but they answer um, with an indirect answer. So, you know, yeah, I, class. I think we have the example of an assistant asks like, hey, what do you want to eat? Do you want to eat sushi? And someone replies by saying, I had that yesterday. And in the context of the conversation, that means no. But the per but seeing like I had that yesterday as an example of saying deny is a bit strange. Um, so like, that's an example of, I suppose, something that's contextual inside of a conversation. 
I, I guess we also have some contextual issues in NLU as well uh, that has to do sometimes with sarcasm, but also sometimes with um, if you have the sentence, a man ate a lion or a lion ate a man. Uh, bag of words says same words, right? <laughs> uh, but, but the meaning is completely different. And I would argue one of these two sentences is hopefully like an outlier. Um, like those are also just like linguistic. I'm hoping both of them. <laughs> yeah, both both are hopefully more of an outlier. If if if, if you see that sentence in like a Domino's pizza <laughs> assistant to order your pizza, let's say that that'd be weird. But um, but but it's bag of words and like how do you deal with these situations? And then very quickly you come to the conclusion of language is hard. Um, so this whole contextual way of looking at things makes a lot of sense. And that's a, uh, I haven't done the the bin count, but I do believe the word contextual. Um, is uh, very specific to the research channel. Like I, I, I'd like to think I see that word appear at least like three times a week. Uh, yeah, probably. That, like I said, that's why it's notorious because it's one that I think we're really, um, we're really interested in, and we talk about a lot. And we also do talk about, um, like how we can better leverage um, conversations that come in. So uh, I think the way that we do it right now is that you can use conversations that your assistant had um, at, with a real with a real person that you can use those kind of either to correct things manually if you if it went the wrong way or you can um, if it went the right way you can use that sort of as a way to test the assistant and make sure that it doesn't regress. Um, but what I think or what, what we've kind of talked about as being pretty interesting would be uh, to be able to use those as kind of negative examples, right? Like if something goes wrong, if there's some way to kind of leverage that. And I think that's one of these things that's like a lot easier with our, on kind of on the NLU side, that's a lot easier with our intent classification paradigm that we were talking about earlier, that it's a lot easier to kind of look at an example and say, okay, if it was classified with, with this intent, then what intent should it have been classified as? Um, so it's a lot easier to go through the things that are coming in, correct those, and then use those as training data. But I think for the stories, it's a little bit more complicated. I, I think stories in general are also just more complex because um, the, the next action doesn't just depend on the previous thing. It also depends on like whatever happened before that. Um, so there's definitely more of this time series aspect in that. Uh, whereas NLU examples are definitely like a one-to-one -one mapping from like text to a label. Um, the and, yeah, and again, like natural language is also just kind of hard. And another thing I always like to remind people of is like sometimes you hear the the argument of oh, but I thought you had like language models and embeddings. Uh, and, yeah, I mean they can help out. You can, you can you can do some benchmarks and see if they uh, they make a difference. But usually, a lot of these embeddings are trained in the context of Wikipedia. Uh, and if you look at two people talking, uh, the language on Wikipedia is very much unlike uh, two per people in a bar. Um, just give like a somewhat silly example, but like uh, what you train embeddings on is very much unlike a conversational data set typically, uh, which also makes it uh, just a bit harder to um, to do something with that. Uh, not, not to say that I have seen plenty of examples where uh, the spacey embeddings actually do fine, that they do add a bunch of context that do improve the training scores. Um, you also wanted to say something, Felicia, about that? Yeah, no, I was just going to, I think I think we're on the same page about that one. Yeah, that the embeddings, I think, are often seen as, as a free lunch, um, but they're not necessarily. So, uh, yeah, they're, I think people put a lot of stock into them, and you've done a video along these lines before. I think that... Um, they can it's also make very, it worse. It's very attractive. Well, it's very attractive to think, okay, I just need to figure out the right embeddings and then everything will go smoothly from there. But um, sadly, that isn't always the case. Yeah, and, and, and it deserves to be mentioning, especially because some of these language models can be heavy just in terms of computation. Um, like, you don't want to... Yeah, you could put a GPU on the thing, but uh, if, it'd be nicer if you just don't need it. There's also something... Uh, inference time matters as well. Um, some extra questions started coming in uh, that are related to the uh, recent uh, graph stuff that's been in the uh, machine learning pipeline. Uh, and it's a pretty good question. So Raza 3.0 uses graph nodes as training components. That's correct. A uh, question from Seraph. Um, but Seraph says, uh, I have noticed from the graph schema that there is, for each NLU component, a train and a run version. Why is that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's basically just to reflect that when you are training, you have different kind of constraints and you're running different functions of the components. 
Um, I think usually we call these process or maybe process messages or something. Mm, don't have it at the top of my head now, but um, what you should see is that they're slightly different. And I think the idea also is that you can reflect that for some components, um, there isn't really as much training involved or any, like some of them are pre-trained. If you think about uh, like the spacey family and um, you know duckling or whatever, and those don't really actually need to be trained the way that it used to be when we before we had this graph architecture is that we just kind of what we call training was really initialization and that was just kind of because that was easy for us to do it that way but um cleaning up that whole concept with the graph architecture means that uh, we can sort of make the training a little bit different from the running the uh, I, I, there might be this implementation detail as well. I, it's all implemented in Dask, right? If I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. So Dask also has a notion of like a graph, but it's a very much a computational graph, uh, not necessarily conceptual, but just quite literally, uh, which which instruction needs to happen before the other one. Um, and I can imagine that part of what you're seeing, if you're going into the more low level bits of the code base, um, like a computational node that says we have trained something is a requirement for that node also to run something sometimes. So it depends like on what level of depth you are looking at our API. Uh, but the reason why you might see a distinction between the uh, train part and like the, pro uh, the process part, I think if you go into the low level uh, Dask stuff, this is like the implementation detail distinction there. Um, I could be slightly mistaken, but I, I recall having a conversation with one of our engineers on how this might be built. Uh, and the fact that Dask tends to work in this graph sort of way might also explain part of the design decision there. Um, didn't, didn't touch the low level stuff, but I, I have talked to Toby about it way back in the day. Um, the main thing to observe there though, um, training times tend to be just a whole lot faster because now all the components can be cached. Uh, that's, that's the main thing that you're probably gonna notice if you're gonna play around with these. Uh, if you're making your own custom NLU components, you typically don't need to um, worry too much about this. Uh, the only functions you have to implement yourself are pretty much like what Felicia said. I think process is like one of them. Uh, there's mm -hmm. create, uh, but you don't have to worry about the the whole like, is this the training node or is this um, like the, the process node? That is something that Dask will handle on your behalf as well. Um, then we are getting some more uh, extra questions coming in that are related to machine learning as well, which is uh, always great. Um, what's Raza's thought on having a natural line NLG from Hugging Face to deploy of Raza Core and Raza X? I'm assuming NLG stands for natural language generation in this case. Uh, how can we achieve dialogue management with end-to-end -end processing conversation? So I might talk on the NLG first. I'm not entirely sure I know what the second question is asking about, but um, yeah, the natural language generation is a difficult one um, because we believe that kind of unfettered or unchecked natural language generation can have some nasty side effects. Um, reason being that a lot of these kind of bigger language models that are used for generation are trained on the internet um, pretty much. And the internet also includes a lot of kind of abusive or I don't know, hateful language, which is the kind of thing that obviously we don't want to create more of. Um, so the way that we're thinking about natural language generation is to do it in a very controlled and checked way. So the baby step that we took I would say, I think this was last summer, was these controlled uh, response variations. And that's not really generation in, I guess, the buzzword type of sense, but um, that is a step towards having your assistance responses be slightly different depending on the situation. But it's still very much so checked so that you can see what, you know, what responses did you define in any language that the assistant is putting out is something that you you told it to put out. Um, so that's kind of the safe version of this. Um, we have been using natural language generation internally for experiments where we use language models as kind of like a user simulator. So that's another option, how those can be used, but you know, um, it's less risky than just kind of letting it talk to users in the, in the wild. I think there's also some interesting ideas around like you could have it generate responses or generate 
text for you and then you still check it and put it in your assistance training data or make it available to your assistant as responses or something like that and then you let your users talk to the things that you've checked but in general our thinking is is that natural language generation is something you have to be really careful with just because it's difficult to make sure that it's not seen harm or something that you wouldn't want your users to be reading yeah so the one thing i've noticed so the, there's a blog post that i shared in the comments by the way so uh back when gpt3 was first released we kind of all jumped on it and uh, also wrote a blog post on some of our findings um, not all of them were great uh, but one thing also just keep in mind is that um I, if i recall correctly if you ask it to generate questions about movies and renting movies and that sort of a thing um, you get the impression that when it thinks about renting movies that you mean blockbuster or like the actual there's like a little store you go to to rent an actual DVD. Whereas nowadays, if you think about renting a movie, like that would be online. Like you would rent one off of like YouTube or something. Um, so also a thing that these are like subtle things that do matter, but like you have to imagine it's been trained on the history of the last 10 to 20 years or something like that. And it could also be that a large cultural chunk of those 10 to 20 years are not something that are that's just going to be very useful in the context of a bot that needs to order a pizza for you. Um, a similar uh, th thing with the word embeddings also I would say like uh, it's very hard to constrain such a language model to only generate the stuff that you're interested in um, besides being racist or anything like that just the whole it doesn't guarantee that it's even factually correct it's like also a very valid concern just be a little bit careful um, and, and we've also just noticed that our clients simply aren't that interested um, like they, they, they want to make sure that it's a good user experience they want to have like some predictable uh, conversations with their users very often uh, if you just automate something that's maybe just good enough as well it doesn't necessarily have to be like a very elaborate conversation but um, uh, yeah so w we notice that there is a lot of interest in GPT-3 but at the same time we also uh, haven't really seen a compelling use case to actually use it uh, mainly because the concerns are just bigger than the uh, potential benefits that we've seen so far um, yeah, that's true. Actually, we even found that for when we were using it as a user simulator internally um, and seeing how that kind of how that plays out. We also found that it was really hard to even make it behave. You like got to steer it. You thought a user would <laughs> yeah. behave. Um, and there's definitely things you can do about that, like, I don't know, fine tune it on things or I think they just brought out, uh, I want to say it's called Instruct GPT. Yeah, something this, like that. Yeah, I think like a week, um, a week ago or so, I think they... Yeah, this is too. pretty recent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think there are definitely ways that you can make it behave closer to what you want it to do, but you're never going to be able to, to beat the comfort of just writing the things that your assistant is going to say out yourself. Yeah, and uh, and like this is kind of more personal thing. Like I've ex uh, I've explored GPT three as like a, a a tool for theater. Like there's a local theater group that I've been working with uh, to see if we can get GPT three to work. Uh, and also the answer there is just most of the time no. <laughs> the, an actual writer is like the, this is a play that wants to do comedy and satire. Uh, and even though you know some of the stuff that came out of GPT three could be funny with like a little bit of steering and all that, uh, an actual comedian turns out is funnier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no surprise, but at the same time, a fun experiment. Um, okay, well, let's move on to, to other questions at this point. Um, so um, there is another question. This one's from Nick. Um, do we have any comments on self-learning chatbots? Hmm. It depends a bit on what they mean with self-learning in this case, because it, be, it could mean multiple things. Uh, I, I think if you're labeling new data for the assistant that comes in and then it learns from that, I mean, it, you could say it's not self-learning because you're labeling, but I could also argue it is self-learning because it's learning from new labels. But I'm assuming um, they mean like without the actual labeling bits, like what can we actually learn from the assistant from new data coming in that's not being labeled? Yeah, so we did a brief foray into this um, pretty much a year ago, we were thinking about how reinforcement learning could help us out um, with kind of learning from existing data and whether it went well or not. I think maybe that's kind of what we're trying to get at. And 
if you had some way of knowing whether a conversation was successful without having to label it yourself, maybe that is going in that direction. It's a little bit difficult. And that's something that we've also been kind of noodling on for a while and also how success markers came to be um, is that it's, it's difficult to say whether a conversation went well or not. And it's even harder to do that automatically. So <laughs> I mean, there is there is a little bit of work I suppose we have done, which is more around the confidence learning, I think. I mean, Dutch did a little bit of work on that, where the idea is, hey, uh, can, if, if there's gibberish coming in, can we maybe detect that? Uh, like, when does the fallback classifier trigger and that sort of thing? And you could potentially argue uh, the, the uh, examples that are the most confusing to the intent classifier, maybe they deserve to be uh, labeled first. I mean, there's been a little bit of that, I suppose, that one could do. I know the Dutch has been playing around with that at least. Yeah, that's true. We have also talked a little bit about how to help users kind of make annotations where it'll have the greatest impact. I think that's kind of in that theme as well. Um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's difficult. If you wanted it to be self-learning, it would be a lot easier if we had some way of kind of figuring out whether a conversation was successful or not. And that's easy, I guess, if you have, if you know maybe what the user wanted to do, um, if you, although if you know what the user wanted to do, then, <laughs> then you could just do it, right? And then it would be successful, yeah. but. Um, I mean, so that's actually the pragmatic thing as well. So like there's this research angle sometimes where you can say like, can we learn something from that? And then we have a research team where, you know, we take questions like that quite serious, uh, which is good because sometimes like a good noodle comes out of that. At the same time though, like, um, Tried and true, new data comes in, you label, <laughs> system improves, <laughs> uh, just works. Um, that, that's also something that uh, the research team is just, I, in my experience at least, was just fairly aware of. Um, I remember some of, one, of, one of the former researchers, uh, Fova, uh, he was always a big, which I think was a sensible attitude, he was always a big fan of, well, you know, if, uh, if the data set you're, you're testing on isn't super big yet, don't do grid search, just collect data first, because otherwise there's also a risk that you're not really chasing a meaningful statistic either, uh, which, which I think is also like a fair statement. So self-learning sounds interesting. Um, actually labeling is still a really good idea, I think. Um, the Oh, there's, there's definitely more questions coming in now, so that's also very, very exciting. Um, there's a question coming in from Jasmine, which I thought, which I, I'm kind of curious what you think about this one, Felicia. So Jasmine says, hey, what is the maximum number of intents recommended when creating a ch big chatbot with Raza? A thousand intents, 10,000 intents, or a hundred thousand intents. Do you have a similar experience with such a number? There's a number of intents. Um, and this is, am I, am I, is this intent? Classes, I'm uh, assuming. I'm, yeah, I'm, not I'm, examples. I'm assuming. Yeah, I'm assuming so. Um, gosh, I mean, I think 1K is already a lot, to be <laughs> honest. Um, uh, um, if I were to say start out with 10, would that be maybe, I mean, 10 feels okay to start with too, right? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I think I would say, I don't have any hard evidence to back this up, but anecdotally, I would say most people are more inclined to make the mistake that they make their intents too fine-grained. Um, so they'll think that maybe the intent for, let's say, you know, I want to order a pizza is different from I want to order a book or something, right? But really, um, I think what what we generally recommend is that you have kind of, if you have intents that map to kind of ways that people will say things. So if I want to order something, it doesn't necessarily change depending on what I want to order, right? There's just a couple of different, well, not a couple, there's many different ways to say that you want to order something, but most of them don't care about what you're ordering. Um, so it's better to think about these things in terms of kind of like, if you can think away the entities or um, the the slots maybe that you're trying to fill then and, and just think about kind of how do people say this and in what context and everything, then that's maybe a better way to think about how to split up your intents. So I would be surprised if I saw a use case where I said, yes, 1K intents is a good idea. Um, I won't, I will, I won't say never, but that I, I mean, seems like a lot. I think 10 is a good place to start. That sounds reasonable. 
the uh, th there's actually two two major uh, like nerd snipes happening in my mind. So one thing I'm wondering is like, okay, just can your memory handle this? Uh, if, if I think about how diet works, right? Like we're <laughs> we're basically embedding every single um, intent, right? In the embedded, sp there's an embedded space for each intent that we're comparing the embedding of the current utterance to. So if you have 10,000 examples, that's 10,000 comparisons we got to do. Uh, so your, your inference time is going to decrease theoretically there. I think for 1,000, you're still going to be fine. But with 100,000, you're definitely going to be pushing it. Um, and also, one thing I'm kind of wondering, if you have 100k uh, intents, that sounds like you might have 100k frequently asked questions or something like that. Like at some point, I can imagine it starts becoming more of a retrieval kind of a task than necessarily a intent classification kind of a task. Um, in which case, you're probably thinking about like approximate nearest neighbor kind of algorithms in order to get that to work. Um, Raza doesn't necessarily do this out of the box, but uh, there is a blog post that I will try to search in a moment uh, where I attach uh, Gina, which is a neural search engine, and Lunar as custom actions inside of Raza. Uh, so if you do have one of these instances where it's definitely like a retrieval task, kind of frequently asked questions style, uh, you can definitely do that inside of Raza, but it's not really an a intent problem, I think. Um, and, and to be honest, even for frequently asked questions, 100k frequently asked questions, um, it feels like some of those questions aren't going to be asked that frequently. It's probably like a very long tail you're going to hit at some point. Um, I, I'm wondering, like in academia, we, you would notice way better than I would. Uh, well, like, what's a, if, if we have a look at like intent classification data sets, like my, the biggest one I've seen had 150. I don't know if yeah, you know of I any. Don't th I don't think I've ever seen anything bigger. Um, I mean, it all it also depends on, I think the way you want to think about it, right, is it not only do you want your intents to, like I was saying earlier, kind of take advantage of like things that maybe sub intents would have in common, but also if you had that many intents, like how many examples do you need and how do you keep those balanced, right? Like if you had thousands of intents then it's hard for me to imagine that you would be able to deal with these. We talked a little bit earlier about like class imbalance problems that you might run into. Um, and I think that this is only harder the more intense that you have. <laughs> um, just because I think there are always some intents that are kind of going to have many examples. Um, yeah, so. and, and, and also some of this comes back to the contextual topic, right? So there's going to be a couple of utterances that won't really fit an intent. Um, so the question then is, uh, do you want to make a separate intent the moment that an utterance doesn't really fit another one? Or are you going to solve that with end-to-end -end kinds of algorithms instead? Uh, those are also, like I think, fair considerations too. I, I think in general, though, like the moment if someone says, hey, Vincent, I've got a chatbot. It has a thousand intents. I, it's not really performing well. Could you have a look? Part part of my mind is thinking, well, there's your problem, I think. Um, I will be interested, though. And I'm, I'm genuinely curious to hear if there are systems that actually have a thousand intents, though. I do think that will be like super interesting, um, if, if only for the numerical aspects of it. Um, but it certainly doesn't sound like the way I would start. I think, I think yeah, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know what would happen. I don't know if I want to know what happens when we try and train diet on that many attempts. Although I am, you're right. I am curious about the yeah. use case. If anyone has one, I would love to hear about it. Yeah, no, but, um, but genuinely, I would be super interested, actually. Yeah. Especially if it's actually running in production. Like, that would be mega interesting, even. Um, so uh, Nick uh, has a sort of follow-up question, I think. I will, I will scroll back up because there's lots of questions that just came in. Um, any comments on chatbot recommendation systems? Are there approaches that are uh, general here? So I think this is the case where a chatbot will be making like recommendations for a user uh, inside. Yeah, so I think we have, I think we have a small kind of toy example that does this right concert bot i think does recommendations potentially i've never i've never really played with concert bot actually to be honest but uh like, i what, think what, what, it does um if i'm not misremembering yeah so we have kind of a toy example um i guess recommendations is kind of formulaic right like Really, I suppose you would start with gathering some requirements from a user, and the way to do that would probably be a form. Um, 
So then you're getting kind of the information from the user that you're going to base the recommendation off of. Um, and I think we also have an example in our docs of like how you can make the forms dynamic too. So you could have not only a form, but then depending on what the user says within the form, you can change the questions that are asked and the required slots that need to be filled. Um, I think the example that we have in the docs is like, uh, you're trying to find a restaurant for a person. And um, if they say that they want to sit outside, then you follow up and say, did you want to sit in the shade or the sun, something like that. So um, you can also kind of have follow up questions uh, through the use of dynamic forms. And then the question is kind of, I guess, a more interesting problem, although that's not really kind of a chatbot problem anymore. The most interesting problem then is maybe how do you turn that information that the user just gave you into a recommendation? Um, so I guess a trivial way would be that, you know, you just get these lists of requirements from them and then you return everything that they, um, that kind of fits those requirements. So maybe if they had a restaurant, they said, this is the kind of cuisine and stuff. And then you have 10 restaurants in your database, then um, you would return those 10. We do have, although I think that this is maybe due for a revisit, we do have this concept of like a knowledge base and knowledge base actions. Those might be helpful there. It deserves to be meant uh, the knowledge base is an experimental feature. Uh, feel free to play around with it, but it is an experimental feature at the moment. Um, so um, play around with it, might change. It's the only sort of caveat I do want to mention there. Uh, but definitely, that, that yeah, you're right. It does sound like there's something you could do there as well. Um, mainly, could, like I can imagine like you could put your inventory in there or something like that. Like these are the mm -hmm. products that we have. And then if someone is mentioning something that so sounds to be similar like one of the products, then you can kick in like a recommender that says something along the lines of, hey, what you're describing sounds like this. Uh, is this something you're interested in? Yes, no. Um, part of me is wondering, like, I, I guess you can also do this with a custom action, right? Like you can- which like, part? Well, so I can imagine some recommendations will be based on like the user that's logged in at the moment, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, so that feels like something that could be in a database. Um, and that's something you could probably pre-calculate up front. So you might know, um, suppose you're Netflix, uh, there's a couple of shows that this person really watches. Hey, there's a new season. Okay, then in the database, I have like a list of new shows that this person should be notified of. And if that person ever says hello in a chat bot, this is like the first thing we're gonna say. Uh, like, oh, okay. So kind of like predictive recommendations, like you're trying to anticipate what the user might want before they even ask for it. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I can, if I were to be able to implement my own Netflix recommender, I would. <laughs> like, <it's, laughs> um, uh, because I, it, a lot of these recommendations is also something I've actually built a couple of recommendations before. Uh, a lot of sensible recommendations are actually really simple. Like the, the thing that I just described um, totally works. Um, I, I was working for the Dutch BBC. Uh, the best recommender we ever came up with is just recommending the next episode. People want that. <laughs> and, and just some of these sensible heuristics in the custom action, I think in general could go a long way too. Um, and, and to be honest, I might try that first also. Um, mm -hmm. that definitely, you can do a lot with machine learning and yes, that's great, but just having a, like a benchmark or a base rate uh, that's relatively simple and well understood uh, tends to do miracles for like getting it to production as well. Um, I don't know if we have a proper demo of a recommender using custom actions, but it feels like a, a very straightforward way. I would have to go look. I think that ConcertBot is probably the one that's yeah. closest to closest to what we're thinking of. Um, or maybe FormBot also helps you find restaurants, right? Yes, and uh, yeah, and uh, oh, no, a financial bot has human handoff, but it doesn't necessarily give you like recommendations on financial products or anything. Um, yeah, I think retail demo we had talked about whether you should get like specific recommendations, but I don't think we ever implemented that for the retail demo. So um. we're uh, nearing almost the end of this hour, but there are still like some short questions that just came in. Um, one of them from Jasmine, I think, is particularly appropriate for the uh, research member that we have uh, uh, sort of here. Research questions are great. Um, so Jasmine is saying thank you. Uh, it's nice to hear. Uh, is reinforcement learning useful in conversational AI? Uh, do you know of any projects based on reinforcement learning? And is there like a future for this? Yeah, um, I don't know if uh, Yasmin, you were there already when I talked a little bit that we went into this probably about, um, yeah, pretty much a year ago, we looked into reinforcement learning. Um, 
I, I definitely think it's useful. Um, we haven't really found a way to make it work within the Raza paradigm yet, uh, but that doesn't mean that we won't. And that doesn't mean necessarily that it isn't useful. Um, definitely is. Do I know any project? I'm wondering if the question there, I guess, would be um, a Raza project. There's plenty of research on the topic. Uh, so there's that. Um, I don't think I know of anybody who is doing this um, in Raza just because, like I said, I think there's some kind of things that complicate the use of um, reinforcement learning. Do you, do you have a specific example of something that uh, people have hit their head against? I think we, we mentioned the simulator. I think that's the main thing, right? Um, no, actually, the simulator was kind of a different project, and we never really tried to combine those two. No, I think our... our, our it was pretty much what I said earlier that um, we found it difficult to figure out the task su task success mm, yeah, okay. um, in a in a meaningful way. And then another thing that was an interesting hiccup is that the um, that we don't currently allow for multiple actions given a certain state in the conversation so what I mean by that is that if you're in a conversation then there's only one correct action for the assistant to take there's many wrong ones but there's only one correct one and so this idea of kind of doing this path searching doesn't really apply um, so that's kind of a major one yeah that's true so a lot of these video games they have this weird thing where a decision you took in the beginning might only prove worth, worse, uh, worse or good, like at the very end, but you're still able to make the bad decision in the beginning of the con uh, of the game. You're in, in the chatbot. We prefer not to have like very bad decisions being made at the beginning of the conversation. Uh, there's there's parts of well, that's not really the best example, maybe, but there's parts of that that are, that are tricky in conversation land. Well, I think also in our case, this is this reason why we only allow for one action given a certain state is another kind of simplification. I think we were talking at the very beginning of the call, kind of that mm. we make some simplifying assumptions that make it easier to build the system. But then, of course, at some point you realize that they're too simple, um, but it's a lot easier to test the way that we do. So um, if you think about how test stories, it's either you got the, you predicted the action that was supposed to be predicted in the test story or you didn't. And we don't allow for nuances um, like, you know, if I'm ordering pizza, then it shouldn't matter if the assistant asked me about topics, the toppings, sorry, or pizza mm. size first, like that shouldn't, those are still valid flows, but we only allow for one order um, yeah, in the right. way that we test. I mean, uh, I never tried that actually, but if we have a store, it is a rule policy, but the rule policy only triggers the form. Uh, yeah, but it, it, if slots are filled in, then only certain orders will appear in your training data. That that is try that is right. I wonder. Yeah, if, and we yeah. even with when we when we do the slots, um, when we do the slot filling from within a form, I think we impose a certain order. Yeah, that's right. Um, no, so you're right. The domain file does. Uh, like uh, the stories, the stories themselves might allow for it, but the domain file itself determines the order in the in the form, and therefore uh, there's only going to be one order. Uh, yeah, yeah that, it's that, sneaky. Uh, um. Yeah, it's sneaky. <laughs> uh, it's a good, good one though. It's a, yeah, definitely a sneaky one. Uh, oh yeah. Today I learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's easy to forget, and yeah. it, I, I think it makes a lot of sense if you think about how we test things, and that this is kind of the easiest way to test things and everything. Um, but yeah, of course, now I guess we're kind of running into the limits of that in terms of research. Yeah, no, and, and also, uh, and, and that's also something we we tend to rediscover as well in the research team is. Uh, we don't consider um, a conversational AI a solved problem whatsoever. <laughs> like, uh, the, the, especially if you consider there's natural language involved, especially if you consider there's turns involved and like all the nuance that happens there. Um, to make a demo is fairly easy. Uh, to make it work actually and like to sort of move the needle forward, um, there's actually a whole lot of work, hard work involved. Uh, that's definitely true. Um, exciting though yeah, true so. that, that, that's that's why we work at raza <laughs> keeps me in a job <laughs> well and also and also that this is why raza exists right like if you if we can if all we needed was fit predict learn uh then you would have used scikit learn for this uh, and you really do need more uh for lots of reasons 
Um, we are nearing the end of the uh, office hours, though, so I would like to thank everyone for uh, submitting their questions. Uh, we weren't able to get to everyone's question, unfortunately. Uh, what you could do, though, is if you have a, uh, like a, a burning question, uh, feel free to post it on the forum. Uh, my username on the forum is Koning, K-O-A-N-I-N-G. Um, feel free to tag me in there, and I will uh, have a look and see if I can help you directly there um, tomorrow. Um, yeah, I think I'm just Felicia, so... The yeah, like the and, and like there's lots of other so also I should admit if I have a look doesn't mean I will be the person answering. I might <laughs> proxy to people who know more, like Felicia, uh, or mirror image, Felicia. But um but I, having said that, uh, Felicia, thank you so much for uh joining. Uh, everyone who's joining on YouTube, thanks for joining. And we will be 